Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. As always, we have a good friend and brother, Andy Sheckman, CEO of Miles Franklin, joining us for our monthly symposium on the latest financial updates. If you are new to the channel, please do like, subscribe, and share so that others can gain the knowledge you have and hit that subscribe bell so you won't miss any of these updates. Andy, as always, brother, good to see you. Thanks for joining us. And how are you doing today? I'm all right, my man. Good to see you too, buddy. It's been uh been a little bit. I had the uh the Rick Rule conference all of last week and uh kind of kept me tied up, but certainly good to be back with you and uh, appreciate the invite as always, dude. Oh, it's always a pleasure, my man. Well, we got a bunch of questions to ask you as always. So I've been uh, going with our team to try to put together as always the best uh, detailed questions to elicit the right information from you and your expertise. So we'll get started right at the top. Um, obviously, I think we have to talk about the elephant in the room and that is of course the inside job potential uh, assassination attempt on President Trump over the weekend. Um, have you seen a jump in retail buyers for gold and silver since that incident? Yeah, uh, let me put it this way. I saw a big jump in rhetoric, in, in communication, in anxiety. Yes, we've seen some orders, so, some large orders that came over the weekend. Hmm. People who I, I'm in contact with quite often, larger existing clients who have no problem reaching out to me on a weekend uh, did so. There's a lot of anxiety, and I guess I would just simply say, John, I think it's it's interesting, a thought experiment. When you think about how fragile the world is, how fragile the ecosystem is, it's about as fragile as an eighth of an inch. If it had been an eighth of an inch to the left, what would the world look like today? What would the world look like if he had died uh, on that podium? Um, and I wonder, you know, when we talk about this entire system, which for whatever reason people have always figured was completely and total, totally stable. Now, I'm not saying the world would have ended and things would have gone haywire, but certainly what would it have said to countries like China, like Russia, um, what would the future look like? Um, what would the confidence be in, in, in this system moving forward? And I would caution people to realize that, you know, we are on razor's edge. Much of what is the status quo or considered normal could be hanging in the balance by something as minimal as an eighth of an inch. Don't mean to be, I'm not trying to be sensational here. I just think, you know, I was watching it live. And what would have happened had it hit him? I, I wonder what the world would look like today. I mean, would we be on the precipice of a civil war? And any way you look at it, I think that should be emblematic of the way that we look at things in a larger picture right now that, you know, we're just one event away from something. And I've been saying this in every podcast I've been doing for the past month or two that, you know, if you think it's going to be smooth sailing between here and the BRICS meeting in October and the election in November, God willing, um, I got a bridge to sell you. I think this is probably just the beginning. So I guess only time will tell, but I'm glad you brought it up. And obviously, I think the part that really upsets people more than anything is the implication. I mean, how stupid do they think we are that a perfect light uh, sign of, of or, or, or line of sight, rather, 120 yards away? You know, I, I, I do a lot of shooting. And um, if you shoot an AR-15 with a, a, a laser scope or a red dot, from 100 yards away, it's it's beyond ridiculously easy. And to have given this person that, that sight line, you have to wonder what the hell is happening in this country to where that would have not been the very first place that they would have stationed uh, officers. And you have to wonder, is there a fine line between conspiracy and reality? Is there a fine line between reality and chaos? I don't know, John, but... When I looked at that, I said, my God, how the hell did this person get up on that roof? How did he get through the perimeter carrying a weapon? How did he get on a roof with a direct, unencumbered line of sight? Um, and you wonder, you know, I mean, you wonder. That's all I'm going to simply say. And I think this is why people need to, to um, prepare for 
things that, uh, you know, things that, that will spring up out of left field. Yeah. And, and the one thing I can say, Andy, and this is not to proselytize, is just my team and my personal belief ethos system that God's in control and the Lord was with him and is with him and is not going to let any harm befall him. But we have to do our part in staying in prayer for him as a community. And the other thing I'm certain of, and I'm sure you would, you and your, your viewers would concur, if, if at least not the former, the latter, we need to start coming together as a nation. This division is what the deep state is counting on. We need to start uniting. Our strength is in our unity. And as we do that, and again, more of us than them, it's a lethal combination to the, the plans of the enemy. So Couldn't just, agree more, John. I mean, I've been saying that forever. The divisiveness is one of the worst things that, to me, the worst developments that we've seen over the last four or five years where, you know, you're defined by who you voted for in the last election, right. election, your, um, you know, for, for a movement that is so um, open to diversity, it just seems that there's such aversion to diversity of thought and of ideology and and it's created these barriers you're right and i agree with you brother more than you know that to me it's the it's the it's this divisiveness that is more concerning than just about anything because the american spirit has done best over the years with its back against the wall but as i've been saying on so many countless podcasts when i come to this point it's that we were a united country we were americans it was more than anything we were americans there was no delineation and that seems to have been something that has been usurped. So I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I, I pray that we see some form of unity to stop this madness, which is seems to be spiraling out of control. Agreed, agreed. So um, pivoting forward, Andy, uh, another question I want to ask you amongst, I got a lot for you today, since we talk a few times a month. Uh, the baby boomer generation to me is particularly concerning and at, at risk. Uh, I did a little research over the weekend. According to Market Insider, roughly 45% of boomers have no precious metals, and Gen X is at 35%. How, when I say we, I mean you and I collectively, a community talking about synergy and unity. How do we help convince the boomer generation to get it and at least get some position in the game, precious metals, 401k conversions, et cetera? You know, it's that's an interesting question um again we have diverged so far from what was into a belief that the road to retirement is only paved with stock certificates and mutual funds and that's a very dangerous road to be on right now um you know this is an environment where This is an environment where where people have become accustomed to the Federal Reserve coming in and fixing everything, and and everything will be okay. Um, the Fed will just come in and provide more monetary accommodation to lower interest rates. And um, this environment that we have seen, John, that has been suppression of interest rates, which has created massive distortions and misallocations in resources and capital and distortions in, in asset prices has given people a false sense of security and, and really given a false reading of price discovery. What are things worth in an environment where interest rates have been kept so low and money has been rained down upon the market? You know, Ludwig von Mises, the godfather of, of Austrian economics, said that there are no means of avoiding a final collapse of a boom brought about by credit expansion. And he says the alternative is only whether the crisis should come sooner as the result of the voluntary abandonment of further credit expansion or later as a final and total catastrophe of the currency system involved. And, and, and where are we in this game? Um, now you hear people talking about lowering rates again, or the Fed lowering rates again to accommodate again. And at some point, this catastrophe of the currency system in which he speaks of is coming. And unfortunately, most of the people don't understand this yet because the allocation across the entire United States financial matrix from Joe and Jane six pack to the Harvard endowment fund in precious metals is one half of 1%. Mm -hmm. 
What I try and tell people, John, is that gold and silver are not investments, they're wealth. They are wealth that has outlived everything the world has ever thrown at it. But more importantly, you have it as the only other tier one reserve asset in the world, as according to the, the Bank of International Settlements. They are now trying to even elevate it higher to a high quality liquid asset. This is a, a petition of sorts to the LBMA where they're saying, you know, we need to make this an, a high quality liquid asset, um, which basically, if you look at a high quality liquid asset, it, and to the BIS rather, uh, it is an asset that would be on a bank's balance sheet that would be as good as cash roughly for 30 days, where if there was a problem that it gives you the ability to maintain solvency for up to 30 days for the system to be fixed, it puts it to the highest, highest, highest level of, of liquidity and of an asset. Um, the central banks are buying it at, at levels the world has never seen before. The exchangers are being bled dry by the most sophisticated traders in the world. You have to be very high up on the food chain to drain the LBMA, the COMEX, the ETFs, and the, and the Shanghai Metals Exchange. This tells you that the biggest, most sophisticated, well-informed money in the world is, is, is spewing rhetoric at the same time doing the opposite. They are accumulating whatever is not nailed down. And the biggest, the biggest thing about it is the repatriation of gold. We're seeing all of these countries repatriate their gold, dozens and dozens and dozens of them, from the New York Fed, where for the last 30, 40, 50 years, it has been the safeguard for all of these countries so they could access the COMEX. And the same thing is true with, with the Bank of England, with the LBMA. Case in point, uh, India bought one and a half times the amount of gold they did all of last year in the first four months of this year. One and a half times what they did last year in four months, but sent it all back to India instead of leaving it at the Bank of England and the New York Fed. They also repatriated 100 metric tons from the Bank of England that they've held there since 1991. Counterparty risk is a big deal. And unfortunately, John, this is why so many people don't succeed in investing. They follow the herd, the herd mentality. This leads to a whole line of economics uh, and, and thought in, in wave theory. Elliott wave, Kondratiev wave, these are, are schools of economic theory that are all based upon human emotion. And this is another reason they say there is no bull market like a metals bull market, because every other bull market speaks to our greed. They say we're motivated by greed and by fear. After 20, 30 years, actually 40 years since 1982 of falling interest rates, which has led to massive bull markets, the greatest ever in, in stocks, bonds, and real estate, this greed mentality, this greed gene is embedded in our DNA. And people think that recency bias and normalcy bias that the Fed will come in and rescue everything, like I was just saying, is just part of the fabric of the United States. What they are missing is that this is, we are on the foothills of crossing a Rubicon that we've never crossed before, that ultimately could lead to a changing of the guard. And the reason they say there's no bull market like a metals bull market is that it appear, appeals to our fear, our concern. Mm -hmm. And so as people wake up and realize that there is trouble, I think you will see a rush into precious metals, into a very, very small market cap in comparison to the amount of money that's out there. And most people, by the time they realize they need an allocation of metals, not to become wealthy as an investment, but because it is wealth, that the biggest, most well-informed money in the, on the planet, the central banks, have been buying hand over fist for the last several years using the suppression of the Western paper markets to mask the price and to mask their acquisition. So how do you get people to do it? I don't know. I've been trying forever. I try and simply say to these people, it is not an investment, it is wealth. And you must have an allocation of it in your portfolio to weather these kinds of storms. Part of the problem, however, is that people assume that Owning gold is only for when the sky is falling. It's not. Gold has outperformed every major asset class since 2000, except Bitcoin, which started from zero. It has outpaced everything, including the S&P 500 over the same period of time with dividends reinvested, average about 9.5%. Gold is 9.9%. .9%. It's the tortoise, not the hare. So not only does it 
preserve your purchasing power. And not only has it outperformed everything, it's doubled the 10 year treasury in terms of performance. But in this environment of counterparty risk, in terms of the central bank sanctioning and confiscation of assets, but in terms of us, the counterparty risk, the systemic nature of all of these large institutions tied together with derivatives in a very debt laden society, it's an asset that has no counterparty liability. So I try my hardest to wake people up. And, you know, coming on a on your show, which was a, a new audience to me, I hope I'm waking some people up. I hope you're waking some people up. It's never been more important to understand that gold is wealth that has outlived everything the world's thrown at it. And as the old saying goes, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Well, here we see the central banks at it once again, buying it at a level and repatriating it at a level from the exchanges of stability and supposedly the rule of law in the West, kind of LOL there, the uh, the New York Fed and, and the Bank of England, they're, they're bringing it home. And uh, I think we're running out of time for these people who need to have it in their, in their possession to do so. And I don't say that as a salesman, I say it as, um, as something I believe in my soul, that there will come a, a great awakening. We're not quite there yet. We're starting to see it with some of my much very larger clients who have been placing very large orders and are very concerned. Um, most people, however, it's not on the radar screen yet. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And we're, we're doing our best, Andy, along with you in conjunction to make a clarion call to our respective audiences. And so I think, I think it's like you've always said, repetition and sincerity is the key. We just continue to engender that sentiment. I'm glad you brought up the Fed because that was one of my next questions I wanted to ask you. I find it curious, Andy, that the Fed has announced one rate cut for sure in September, but now they're doubling back and capitulating and talking about three rate cuts for the rest of the year, which is what they initially said, as you know, vis-a-vis -vis September, October, November. It would seem to suggest that we're in the melt-up and that the bust is going to come of the, the economy, the old economy, the old Federal Reserve, the old dollar system, as you know. I'm just talking for the people who may not, who are new, who may not be fully aware of this concept. Uh, it looks like that's going to start before year's end and carry into next year. Is that what you're kind of seeing on your respective radar as well? You know, I've said, I've been pretty consistent saying I can't believe that they will lower rates when they have to issue pretty damn close, John, to 14 trillion in new debt just to, uh, uh, just this year to retire the maturing debt that's coming due to pay interest expenses and cover the spending and and irresponsible uh, fiscal uh, policy uh, via our deficits and our government spending. Um, I don't know how they lower rates. Where does the money come from? But I'll say this: even though you know they haven't made a formal announcement about intervening in the debt markets or by lowering rates. I believe they have already, and it's flagrant if you look at it, because they're managing the, the rates lower already. And I say that because, look, when, bond, when, when bonds are sold more than they are bought, rates rise, more supply than demand. When bonds are bought more than they are sold, rates fall, more demand than supply. And with countries around the world dumping our treasuries in record amounts, like China, like Russia, like Japan, who's selling massive amounts of debt to defend their collapsing yen. Um, when this is happening, uh, if there were not a buyer that could buy bonds in the limited, uh, unlimited amounts, then rates would rise. It's as if the Fed has stepped in and is buying them already. And we're supposed to believe that countries like the United Kingdom and Ireland and, and Cayman Islands are now replacing these massive buyers of our treasury who have, who our treasuries who have really our creditors who have allowed us to live beyond our means. These are the countries that are already massively in debt, like the UK. So you got a indebted country like the UK buying our debt when we're the biggest debtor of all time, which is, just being sold in order to finance the interest on the debt that's already out there. This is a, a very bad thing. So yeah, c will they lower rates? I don't know. I don't believe a word they say, John. I mean, first they, you know, go back to Bernanke, the subprime crisis is contained. Bang, a week later, it collapses. We were told that there is no inflation, and but then it was transitory, but then it was structural. 
you know, and, and, and then it was contained. And now, but they lie about the inflation numbers. They lie about everything. And, and remember, there was going to be for sure four or five rate cuts. And then maybe none. Maybe we raise rates. But now they're saying maybe we lower rates. And if they do come in and lower rates in September, it's the most politicized rate cut I've ever seen right into the election. It's mm -hmm. just a bunch of crap. Raising, yeah. lowering rates by 25 basis points is spitting in a pool. It does no good. Um, will they continue to do so? I don't know. But when we have a spending addiction to the tune of a trillion dollars of debt every 100 days, which took 200 years to do the first time, when we have 14 trillion in debt that needs to be, you know, paid for somehow by rolling over what is coming due about 10 trillion on top of the debt that we're issuing on top of everything else, who the hell's paying for it? Where's it coming from? And, and that's what leads to more and more inflation. That leads to monetization of the debt that leads to higher rates It all, all roads lead to the same place. So yeah, if they do lower rates, yeah, that's great for gold. It's um, it's, you know, it's good for the stock market. Um, it's a situation that um, they're damned if they do and they're damned if they don't. And in the end, it will mean not very much other than the rhetoric that surrounds it that makes people bullish all over again and signals to the rest of the world, why the hell would we want to sell them anything, them being us, to receive an inflated currency? And certainly, why would we want to buy their treasuries, which continue to be inflated um, and which you know, have been a tool of weaponization. So this is this is a very scary time, if you will. And and I guess, yeah, they may do it. Certainly there's that's the prevailing wisdom, but uh they can manipulate all they want, the short term rates. They cannot control the long term rates. Um well, maybe they can. Maybe they can by printing money and handing it to countries like the UK under the table uh to buy our treasuries to make it look this way. But you know, um, as these as as these indebted Western countries buy more debt, what do you see happening across the globe? These other countries are selling debt and buying gold and buying commodities. So you know, the West, who who it has virtually nothing in the way of 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 commodity production and or manufacturing production, we don't have the you know the the um, the, the ability to manufacture anything anymore. We've offshored all of that, as did the UK. We're buying more debt and accumulating more debt as these other countries are shedding debt and, and buying commodities and forming alliances. This is a very precarious time, and um, I don't know. I think in the end, it doesn't matter very much, but it only signals to the rest of the world that we are a doomed um, uh, empire that that is um, on its way down and those countries understand that commodities are the thing to own not not another country's debt yeah exactly and i think podcasts like this to your point earlier andy is to give people faith and confidence that we can move counterintuitive to whatever they're going to do and personally i i'm you know i'm convinced and our team's convinced that they always had an agenda to take the old economy down uh, so by being what we're in in god's money we can always have confidence to hedge against that and uh, as Sun Tzu said, you know, you always talk about the Chinese saying, we live in interesting times. Sun Tzu said, you know, never interfere with an enemy that's in the process of destroying themselves. And we can see them. If you look deep enough into the visceral caverns of it, you can see that they are clearly intentionally trying to destroy the old system. They think they're going to, to you know, push us into their great reset, but God has a plan. And shows like this, I think we're trying to help Holy to steer people in the right direction, ship to shore away from uh, their perilous agenda. I hope um, you're right, brother. I truly, honest to God, truly hope you're right. I do. Well, the key is to have faith, right? So, um, you know, Andy, I'm going to have a sort of a longer question here because I'm trying to unpack a little bit more in the time, the short time we have. So this is kind of a two-part question and one, if you will. You were talking about China. I'm sort of surprised that Japan hasn't joined the BRICS yet, given their precarious financial situation. They have an aging population, which is due to the fact that they have, uh, they're buying gold, you know, uh, surreptitiously under the cover of night. They've got uh, all of a, all, a lot of our treasury yield bonds that they're trying to dump over the side of the, of the, of the boat, if you will. And so that's one. And then, you know, Mexico has a, a mining silver issue. I'm sure you heard about, uh, I want to read something to you. Claudia Scheinbaum, I think she was just elected um, in, re in respect to managing the open pit mines. Um, Jim Willie and I were talking about that on a podcast last week. He believes that 
roughly 40% of the silver is going forward is going to be coming out of those mines. And she's trying to basically manipulate the ability to get access to that. So the question is, do you see Japan? We've talked about this before, uh, but for those who haven't seen the show, it bears repeating. Do you see Japan at some point here, Andy, in this season we're in, jumping into the bricks out of necess necessity of survival? And do you see Mexico jumping out of the USMCA agreement that they were set up for and jumping into the BRICS as well? Well, Mexico has at, at one point expressed interest in joining the BRICS. And while it, they haven't done anything formally that we know of, um, they have expressed interest. And I wouldn't put it um, past them to, to explore that further. I think Japan has a greater chance of, of doing just that. Um, but Japan is in a position where they have to get their house in order first. Um, they have been buying gold and they have been selling yen and it's, it, I mean, or excuse me, selling uh, treasuries in order to massive amounts actually to defend the, the yen. Uh, interesting, it takes over 370,000 yen to buy one ounce of gold right now. And um, this is not because gold's been going up. It's because the yen has been collapsing. And gold mm -hmm. has been doing a good job of retaining its purchasing power despite the massive manipulation to suppress its price. Um, look, these are both Western allies. And I would say to you that I think at some point it will be every man for themselves. Do I think Japan will do it? I think there is a far greater chance of them making that switch uh, than Mexico, although Mexico is the one who has at some point expressed interest. Now, you have a new president there. I don't know what her view is on the BRICS. Um, but, it, you know, yeah, could it happen? Absolutely. You know, it's interesting when you look at uh, Jim Willie was talking about a lot of uh, uh, the, the silver-producing countries out there, Purdue, uh, Peru, um, Mexico, China, all, and a few others. All, I mean, so I think uh, Mexico's one, China's two, Peru is three, uh, and a few other countries forming a cartel, like an OPEC-style mm -hmm. cartel for, for silver. I mean, if that really is the case, then they're closer to joining than we would have thought. Um, I don't know. I, I will just simply say this. Out of the meeting that just came out of um, Novograd, Novograd, Russia, Coincidentally, it was the, coincided with the G7 meeting in Italy, and and uh, the, the royal crown prince of Saudi Arabia turned down an invitation, yet sent his financial delegates to the the BRICS meeting in Novograd, where 59 countries said we're going to join BRICS. Now we don't know which of those countries who they are. We will know more soon enough. But yeah, I um, I think that that Japan would have a greater likelihood of of joining the BRICS because it's in that hemisphere, um, at least first before Mexico does. But as I said, Mexico a year or two ago said they were interested in joining BRICS. And, and while that's not anything more than just interest, uh, it, it certainly piqued everyone's attention when that came out. So I guess we'll have to see. But wouldn't surprise me in both cases as at some point, sides have to be chosen. And um, do you want to hang on to, you know, a, a demographic of, of indebted countries with very little in the way of commodities and the ability to produce things? Or do you want to move to a system uh, of, of commodities, of cooperation, um, and of the ability to produce things? So this is, this is right now still early, but yeah, we're, we're moving to that that stage where, where decisions and, and sides will have to be chosen. Agreed. Agreed. And don't forget also, as you know, Andy, and to your cogent point, uh, Vietnam is another one that's already on the list of joint bricks and they have a, a tremendous amount of silver that a lot of people are not aware of. And they, they, they do things obviously very surreptitiously. They're, they're known for that. Um, I'm convinced well, before they would be great we jump players. off that, you know, you had Russia and North Korea sign a mutual defense pact as well as Russia and Vietnam. And mm -hmm. this was just recently. And so when you talk about these, these partnerships uh, of strengthening um, countries like Vietnam, which, um, you know, to your point, you're beginning to see a, a strengthening relationship uh, between these countries and um, countries that have had somewhat of a um, um, less than harmonious relationship with the United States. And, and same thing you're seeing with Afghanistan. They're going to all of these countries 
and saying, you know, let's choose sides. And so maybe they start with the countries that uh, would be more willing to listen. Uh, of course, the countries that are resource rich and, and trade route and, and seed, seed route uh, specific. But um, a lot of these countries that have been very much Western friendly will have to make a decision at some point. And um, we're not quite there yet, but wouldn't surprise me to see that happen sooner than later. Agreed. Agreed. Absolutely. Which is, again, Andy, another perfect segue as we're we're clairvoyantly tracking each other because this kind of ties in another question. This will this will make a lot of our, our foreign currency holders happy. Uh, but uh, China, as you know, we talked offline before the, the podcast began um, when we're doing our debriefing. You know, uh, China is now the the yuan has been sanctioned temporarily in Vietnam, excuse me, in Iraq which has upset them greatly. And they're scheduling a meeting to go over there and basically remove that. Uh, and China has memorandums of understanding, as you are well aware, with several countries, in, in particular Iraq and Vietnam, which we just discussed, as it relates to they need this money for the dinar and dong to happen to power up their militaries, respectively, for future agendas that they have. Um, so that's a good sign as far as what we're waiting for with that to get ahead of it. But I, I thought it was interesting Andy, to note that China hasn't uh, really purchased or added a lot of gold and silver. It looks like in the past couple of months. Do you see them resuming that anytime soon? I don't believe it. I think it's I think it's um, fooey, if you ask me. Um, yeah. You know, my entire career, John, everyone said you can't believe the numbers coming out of China mm. in terms of the amount of gold that they produce. Um, the they've been telling us that they have for a long time, their numbers were stuck on like 1200 metric tons. And, and now we're supposed to believe that they have 24 or 2,500 metric tons. And the first thing I would say is that no one knows how much gold anyone has, including the United mm -hmm. States, where we supposedly have 8,300 metric tons, but we haven't allowed it to be audited since 1953, including Ron Paul being shut down when he when he you know he proposed a, a bill to have it audited to, and was turned down, um, voted down. And why? Why would they? It's, it belongs to the American people. Since 2002, China has been be importing, according to most people's estimations, between one and one thousand and maybe fifteen hundred tons a year, and producing between four and five hundred metric tons a year in domestic production. They're the largest importer, and they don't nearly set a, sell an ounce. Uh, they're the largest domestic producer and importer. And you have banks in China like um, ICBC, which uh, and a few others that are state owned and they buy gold on proxy on behalf of the PBOC. And they work with the refineries all around the world, in particular South Africa and Switzerland. Um, we don't see those import numbers because it's it's done by banks, proxy banks. If And this is supposedly reported to the IMF, who came out a few months ago and said the numbers that China lists are way, mm -hmm. way, way low. And at the same time, if they buy gold that is not that is under 995 pure, they don't have to report that either. They're not telling mm -hmm. us how much gold they are um, producing. Um, and at the same time, we've been seeing massive amounts of gold leave the COMEX and end up somehow in China. And mm -hmm. uh, we've been seeing huge amounts leave the COMEX uh, leave the LBMA uh, and and leave the ETFs. And so there's a ton of gold that is making its way over to China. In fact, recently, over the last month or so, uh, there have been all sorts of reports coming out uh, of gold coming out of New York uh, and because of the Shanghai premium and finding its way over to Shanghai. And um, we've been talking about this for a long time. And in every single instance, it appears that JP Morgan is the counterparty on this. We see the drawdown um, in, in the numbers off the Shanghai Gold Exchange, which is coming from the COMEX. And so, in other words, what we are seeing is um, massive amounts of gold that is being bought in the United States uh, on COMEX and delivered 
via a little known contract that the CME developed in 2015, which is the COMEX, which allows for that gold to be delivered to Brinks, Hong Kong. Now, a few weeks ago, we saw $500 million worth of gold leave COMEX and get delivered to Brinks, Hong Kong, all in kilo bars. Now, the interesting thing about that is COMEX only uses the, the kilo bars for the mini futures contracts. They use the 100 ounce bars for the majority of what they do. But what's interesting is the Shanghai Gold Exchange uses um, kilo bars. And so who's got that kind of money to, to buy $500 million worth of kilo bars that are delivered to Brinks Hong Kong? Now, once it is delivered to Brinks Hong Kong, which is a COMEX eco ecosystem, it disappears and has been taken by truck, my guess, to the Shanghai Gold Exchange, which deals in kilo bars, which is cash and carry. And so the numbers that we are being told, I mean, it's it's amazing. And this is the, the idiocy of the American and the Western system where a little bit of rhetoric smacks down the price and we're all supposed to believe that. We're supposed to believe that they're being honest about it. At the same time, Every country on the planet is 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 disingenuous about the no amount of gold that they hold or the amount that they buy. There was an article last year that was printed in Reuters and Bloomberg that said, I don't remember how many ounces, uh, you know, a huge amount of gold was delivered off COMEX and off the Western exchanges, and they only could account for about 40% of it. And the rest of it they assumed was going to the BRICS countries. My point to you is that there is a lot of stuff going on that is off the, the charts because like the LBMA is is a a peer-to-peer -peer market. It is not a a um it's not a a an exchange market as the COMEX is. The LBMA is a uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It is not a an exchange. It is it's a market where it's it's a bilateral market where we agree to the terms and it can be settled off exchange in it could even be settled in in gold coins. I mean, if we wanted it to be that way, the LBMA is far less uh, transparent, far less in the way of regulations, and every bullion bank on the planet trades on the LBMA. I guess all I'm simply saying to you is those numbers that that saying that China stopped buying for for a couple of months, I think it's crap. And I think they are buying it. They're just not reporting it. The PBOC may not be buying it and reporting it to the IMF, but their, their, their commercial banks are. We're seeing deliveries off of COMEX that end up in China. It's happening and they are not a, a, you know stopping at all, but maybe they're smart enough to realize that's all they gotta do is, is tell the IMF, yeah, we're on a two month hiatus and watch the price fall. But yet look at the, the, the strength in it. So you have positive real yield, a strong dollar, ETF outflows in the West, China not buying, and here we are, we're going back up above $2,400 again. I got a bridge to sell people who believe China's not buying anymore, and um, this is a game of, as you mentioned, Sun Tzu, misdirection. Beat mm -hmm. your opponent without throwing a punch. They misdirect through, through rhetoric. They misdirect mm -hmm. wickedly through rhetoric, and look at how the Western media takes the bait and uh, even the IMF. So yeah, I, I don't think they're, they're, they've are stopped at all. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think it correlates well with what we were talking about earlier about the Fed. You know, it's it's not what they say, it's what they do. And, and a lot of it's just misdirection to keep us off the scent. And again, you know, podcasts like this are, I think, wholly designed to call out their moves so that people can make counter moves and anticipate what's coming to get put them in a, in a much uh, healthier and, and faith-based position. Um, when the crash comes, Andy, and people are start to force to use physical silver and gold, like we were saying earlier, for transactions, will there be a place for pre-1982 copper pennies and nickels, which haven't really changed their percentage of 75% copper and 25% nickel? No, I don't think so. I mean, you're expecting an awful lot for people to understand that, and the amount of copper or nickel that you can get in that is so minute. Mm -hmm. that it wouldn't be worth stockpiling it as far as I'm concerned. Um, you know, I, I, copper, you know, you'd need so many of those pennies to make it worthwhile, it wouldn't matter. So no, I don't think so. I mean, I think you'd be far better off having a handful of pre-65 dimes, which mm -hmm. um, 
you know, are 90% silver by weight, but um, to use the nickels and, and, and the pennies and, and assume people will want them, I think is foolhardy. Okay. I just want to kind of uncover that and at least ask the question in case there's some people might be wondering about that. Um, last question for today, Andy, is American Silver Eagle, as you know, is, is a sought after coin, but you also have, as you well know, uh, the kangaroo and the maple leaf, which are also beautiful coins, 9999 and um, often much cheaper than the eagle. Is there a reason why these more pure sovereign coins cost less? And um, which of the sovereign coins are the best value in your estimation? Well, the best value would be the ones you just mentioned. I mean, there are six major mints in the world. There are others like China and Mexico who really don't amount to much. But of the six, you have the US with the eagle, uh, Canada with the maple, um, you have South Africa with the Kruger and Australia mm -hmm. with the kangaroo, United Kingdom, the Britannia, uh, Austria with the um, Philharmonic. And any of those other than the U.S. and Canada would, I guess the Maple Leafs have come down too. All of them except the Eagle are the best value. Um, it's very interesting, the price action of the Silver Eagle. And my you know if you if your listeners would go and listen to a two-part interview done last year by my buddy Bix Weir mm -hmm. with Jack Sermon, who is the gentleman who um developed the Silver Eagle program for the US Mint. He's been there since day one and since 86. He's about 70 plus years old. And he's pissed off. And he said some things that I was listening to it in doing preparation last summer, laying on a raft in my swimming pool and almost fell off the raft when I heard him say that he was told by his superiors. Now, who would his superiors be? Well, that would be Janet Yellen because it's his superiors, direct superior would be the either the person running the mint who I don't think that's who it is. Or And if it was, that's fine. Then he would have been... He, that person, she, would have been told by Janet Yellen, the head of the Treasury, to only produce as many Silver Eagles, uh, as few Silver Eagles as they possibly could without creating a massive public outcry. Um, the, the Mint has a charter that says they, by law, have to produce as many Eagles as is demanded by the public. Um, he said that the primary distributors came to him at the end of the year and said, we'll take 36 million more. And they only gave him 12. Um, there was such outcry and anger publicly about this that in, in August of last year, miraculously, they found 4 million silver Eagles that they released mm -hmm. um, and premiums came down. Now they started to creep up again and they are higher than everything else. Question is, why would the Mint be doing this? You know, are, are they of the realization that silver is not an industrial metal, but a strategic one? That silver is needed in so many capacities? Um, that it's needed in, in, in military components, which the Silver Institute conveniently ignores in terms of its supply demand fundamentals, yet you know, I can point to a million places where they publicly say that it's used tremendously in um, in, in military applications, in, in high-tech weaponry and aerospace. Um, do they realize that they need this? Do they realize that the majority of the silver that we get comes from other countries and that we better start to accumulate it and not sell it all to the public in the form of eagles? If we don't, we're putting ourselves in a compromised position. I don't know, but I will tell you they've been the model of inefficiency for a very long time. Um, if the price was commensurate, with the other coins, I would say buy Silver Eagles all day long. From a value standpoint, any of the other mints will provide better value. Um, but there is a far greater demand for the American Eagle without question. I think the best value right now in silver, the best value would be pre-65 silver, dimes, quarters, and half dollars. Um, throughout the pandemic, the junk silver, as it's called, U.S. constitutional silver, was very close to the premium on silver eagles. It was eagles and junk silver were higher than everything, all of the sovereign mint coins, way higher. And as we reached December, January, uh, uh, December last year, January this year, premiums have come down and 
the junk silver is lower than everything, but for the past three years, it's been way higher than everything except the Silver Eagle. So you can get a better value on pre-65 silver than anything. But yes, in constitu I mean, in sovereign mint coins, yeah, everything has better value than the Eagle. But if I had my choice, it, it would be the Silver Eagle. Okay. Thank you for that, for the uh, education on that part. Well, uh, unfortunately, it wraps up our podcast for today. So uh, folks, if you are looking for, we are an affiliate partner with Miles Franklin. As always, we recommend these folks. They've been very good to us. And if you are looking for uh, quotations on gold, silver, junk silver, and again, to the folks who have 401ks, pensions that are just kind of sitting there doing marginal work. And if you have any concerns or just a free consultation you want to see about doing even a partial roll over to 401ks, IRAs, or pensions. Uh, Andy and his staff can help you with that. They're uh, well-trained in this. Andy himself has well over three plus decades of experience in this. It's a family-run business uh, and they, they take very good care of you. So uh, if you would mention my name, they'll certainly take care of you and do a free consult. And with that, Andy, any final last words you want to say to the audience, feel free. Yeah, and by the way, it's important, you know, the prices on our website are, are really not the sharp and pencil prices and they're only up for up to ten thousand dollars in purchases but if they send us that email to info at miles franklin and say john dowling sent me uh, we will make sure john that that they will not be the first customer complaint we've ever had in 34 years that we will make sure that they are treated with white glove service and, and are getting the prices that are that priceless that we keep close to the vest will be as competitive as anyone in the country and so Anything you've heard on this show or questions, as John said, on IRAs or rolling over conversions in, from 401ks, IRAs, and, and, and or just wanted to see the competitive price list, uh, info at Miles Franklin and, and John Dowling sent me. Um, yeah, I mean, as, as in terms of final thoughts, look, man, um, it's becoming very obvious that we are entering the, the stage of the cycle where things are going to start spinning a lot faster. Not only is our debt growing by a, a trillion dollars uh, every 100 days, which equates to $100,000 per second, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 100, 200, 300, 400. That's, that's real. But so too as is the craziness around us. And I, we don't have to look any further than yesterday uh, to, to talk about that. Um, I just think it's 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 very important that people realize that unfortunately we're getting late in the cycle and uh, it's never been more important to, I think, protect yourself. And uh, we would love the opportunity to work with your clients and help them do just that in a very transparent fashion and uh, with um, a great deal of, of care and assistance in answering questions and 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 increasing the comfort level. So, it's certainly an honor to have you recommend us um, to your list, and we take that very seriously and and uh, look very forward to chatting with, with your uh, listeners and, and helping them through these crazy times and riding shotgun with you, um, talking about all this stuff for the next several months as we lead into probably the craziest 180 days of, of uh, many of our lives. And I think... Uh, I've been saying that recently, and 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 I think what we've seen over the last few days, I think, is just the beginning, unfortunately. So, um, as the Chinese curse says, John, may we live in interesting times. These are these are anything but dull and complacent, and I think we'll only get more interesting as time goes by. Indeed, we are. Andy, for posterity, can you do me a favor and leave the phone number for people um, if they want to uh, contact you with questions? Sure, it's nine five two nine two nine seven zero zero six. 952-929-7006. And if you do send an email, by the way, tenfold miles Franklin and want to get a call back, make sure you put your phone number there and we will do so for you. Perfect. And we'll leave all those links in the description for posterity. Andy Shackman from Miles Franklin, thank you for as always for being with us and answering all the questions so generously. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Yeah, I look forward to seeing you in a few weeks as well, John. I'm sure there'll be lots to talk about. So you and everyone else out there, stay well. Indeed. Take care.